ES Audio. Where does a hard work ethic come from? I still have my mum sat on my shoulder telling me to look after the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves. So I'm very detailed in the numbers. I think that will always be my way. You know Sarah Willingham. She was on Dragon's Den and she got a seat there by being one of the country's most successful entrepreneurs. That girl from Stoke with a paper round that gave her a pound in her pocket went into hospitality and rose up to not just manage the place but buy it. She turned Bombay Bicycle Club into the biggest Indian restaurant chain in the country. Several more ventures later, she's now set up Nightcap, a bar group with around 30 sites on its books and plans to acquire even more. This is a great time, actually, to start a new business, bring together some of these great entrepreneurs that actually want to grow, that are very, very capable. I'm David Marsden from The Evening Standard. Is it a great time to start a business? Nightcap was founded in 2020, lockdown year. A hospitality company launched when no one was allowed out of the house. Now that's got to be hard work. And when we meet Sarah, the first thing I want to know is, how did she do that? The first thing that strikes me is when you put in, when was Nightcap founded? It comes up 2020. With hindsight, would that have been the best year to open a hospitality company, Sarah? Michael and I had talked about it in end of August 2020. So that was, we'd come out of the first lockdown, but we just had a bit of a taste of the summer, you know, like a bit of a taste of of demand, I think. But we could start to get a feel for, I guess, the macroeconomic landscape that we were coming into And we made the phone call to um, brokers that we'd worked before. And I remember the silence on the end of the phone. Like there was like a a proper pause. He just went, are you absolutely mad? We were like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. This is it. So there's a few things that we'd seen and hoped we were right about. One was the demand I just talked about. The second thing was that we saw over the course of that summer in 2020, actually just how important hospitality was in that I'm providing that safe environment for people to be together, for people to socialise, to play into that important need to be part of a community. The third thing was the property landscape. I'd never seen anything like it, where the balance of power had always been with the landlord. You know, it was really who was the most capitalised, throw the most money at the best sites, you got it. That was it, really. There wasn't much chat about covenant, but it changed and it really changed. And I, I had spent quite a lot of time looking at how those negotiations were going with landlords and could really see that for the first time ever, this was not about your bank balance. This was about your covenant. This was about your ability to be able to pay your rent. So that was really important. There was a lot more property available, but also landlords were like different human beings, to be honest. It was, it was, we were dealing with a, a compl- I'd never seen it. We were able to negotiate in a very, very different way. And I felt that the balance of power actually became a bit more balanced And then the fourth thing was there were loads of entrepreneurs who were backed by the bank or backed by private equity. The private equity had got a portfolio, let's say, of of businesses and were like, we're not doing anything in hospitality. Everybody stop, rein it in, no growth. We're not going anywhere. And suddenly all these entrepreneurs that maybe had got an exit or an event on the horizon, the brakes were just slammed on for them. We, we saw situations where with some businesses, the bank effectively ran them. And again, the entrepreneur was underwater in terms of their equity. So you put all of that together and we were like, well, hang on, this is a great time actually to start a new business bring together some of these great entrepreneurs that actually want to grow, that are very, very capable. So when you put all of that together, we were like, maybe this isn't as bonkers as it actually sounds. But once we were on the market and once we'd floated, then the world looked very different for us. And we were able to raise a lot more money very, very quickly. And we actually acquired three phenomenal businesses in the first 10 months of of Nightcap's life. And we were really lucky. 
Yeah, luck has played a part in here, I guess. But I mean, when, when people were starting to go through the doors of the business, like you said, when people got unlocked from their, from their homes, did you have time to feel a sense of relief at all? Or was it just right now, here do we go? Here we, where do we go next? We definitely, honestly, we are and have continued to be so blooming grateful to our customers for wanting a party, right? And like wanting to come out and continuing to support us. So yeah, I think relief, grateful, excited, you know, there's definitely moments of real apprehension. I think, you know, definitely also going into this coming year, we're like, okay, um, this is a different landscape than we've seen so far. You know, we've been, it's, what What does this mean? What do, what do the energy prices mean for us? You know, what does it mean in terms of staffing? You know, it's been a big thing, the impact of Brexit. So cautiously optimistic always, and all about risk mitigation. That's like my, anything I've ever done in my whole life has always been about risk mitigation. So it's always been about protecting the downside. Can I handle the downside? Can we handle it? If the answer is yes, let's crack on. But you've touched on it there, hospitality as a sector has been through the ringer and is continuing to go through the ringer. You mentioned energy prices there. People are having the, you know, the the restaurants and bars are seeing energy bills going up from thousands to tens of thousands a year. There's threats of a £20 pint, which isn't far off in London anyway. How are you getting through those circumstances when you've got through the pandemic and suddenly all the costs are going up? You know, we're in a very fortunate position in Nightcap and I'm not blind to the fact that so many people aren't. Uh, But we're in a very fortunate position, two things. One, most of our energy is fixed quite far out, actually, and we fixed it at the beginning of this year before all of this disaster happened. Was that deliberate? Did you think this is going to happen or was that just a, a, a normal business practice for you? So we thought um, the, the, there was a, there's a part one of the businesses where we managed to fix just at the last minute when we were getting a sniff of what was happening. Nobody, I, there's not a single person that thought it was going to go this high. I mean, I, I'd be totally lying if I said that I thought the prices would get to, I, I thought they'd go up. Never did I think they would be this high. So that's the, that's the one side of it. And the other side of it is that because we're just so much bigger than, than we were and the individual businesses were negotiating when they were tiny, um, now, of course, we, we buy as a group. We're tracking, you know, tens of millions of turnover um, now and compared to a business that we might have bought that was five million turnover. So it does really make a difference in terms of your of your purchasing power. Now, that's not to say that it's not a risk, because, of course, we still have some sites that we are, we, you know, we've got five, six under construction at the moment. And some of those new ones that we take on might not have a longer term fixed price. So they need to be negotiated now. What you're talking about there being the size of the company helping you get through this, that is the timing of the creation of that company again, isn't it? It's it's moving in at the right time, understanding all these risks there, but going, no, this is right. And I guess having belief in yourself as business people to to put that forward and, and to make that happen. Yeah, so we have an interesting structure, really. Nightcap is like super lean. There's me, Michael and um, Toby, basically. Uh, you know, it, that's kind of it, really, in Nightcap. Obviously, we have a PLC board. The real magic happens beneath us in the sites and in the businesses. And uh, we're very lucky. We have got great people. And, I mean, I was... Best piece of advice I was ever given. It was in my 20s. And um, it's actually the guy who's the chair now of Nightcap. I've known him for many years. He's in my phone as Yoda. Uh, He's a really smart guy. He's always been like a kind of mentor. And he said to me, Sarah, surround yourself with brilliant people. And at the time I was like, well, yeah, obviously. Like, that's not the smartest piece of advice I've ever been given. Who doesn't want to surround themselves with brilliant people? I now know what he meant. He meant people who are brilliant at the things that they're good at people who will free up brain space for you because they're so capable that respond really well to being empowered and I would say without a doubt that you know that size of the group the difference of running a really small business and now being part of a much larger business where you can bounce off other great people and actually collaborate like I 
really force so much horizontal communication across the group because people have got superpowers. You know, Barrio's got a different superpower than the Cocktail Club. The Cocktail Club's got a different superpower than tonight, Josephine. And actually, if we can share those superpowers across the group, what you're going to get is a much better group of businesses that are all run a lot better because they only had their one or two superpowers originally. Well, now they're sharing six. So it makes them all better. And I think that's a big part of why the group structure works. I mean, it, of course, it, God, it has its challenges, right? Like you're trying to integrate three different cultures and different ways of working. And if you want to suddenly share a, an HR director across all three, where do you put that person? Where do they sit? And, you know, so it, of course it has its challenges, but I'm lucky enough to have created this group structure before twice. So I've at least got some learning and muscle memory from it. Um, but when it works, it's real magic, actually. At break time, is it too early for a drink? Depends when you're listening to this podcast. And new episodes are released every Monday morning. If you hit your follow button, the show will be delivered straight to you so you never miss an episode. Do it now while the commercials are on. So we've talked about that kind of the the stress of creating this company, but there has to be a fun side to being a CEO of something like Nightcap. I mean, uh, at the very least, I presume you get to go to to all of these great bars and (laughs) and all of these restaurants. I am never short of a party, right? Like, that's for sure. You know, I'm a real believer in um, doing, you know, I don't, I talk quite a lot about I don't believe in a career path like I really believe in a life path that it's and and people talk about oh can you talk me through your career path and I'm like well not really no because I don't ever want to separate it from the decisions that I've made in in my life to to make a change it might be you know I sold a quite a big business when I started to have children because I was like I can't have a thousand staff and four children in four years. It's just, it's, it didn't work for me, all these people relying on me getting up in the morning. Um, all the decisions that I've made within work have been because of a, a moment in life where I love to work, actually. I, I love business, love hospitality, love people. And I want that in my life, but it's got to fit in. It's got to slot in with, with the place that I am in my life at that, at that particular time. So my kids are a bit older now. My youngest is 11. My oldest is just 16. It's a different period where I can work more. You know, they, they don't rely so much on, on me all of the time. And, you know, I love the industry. Like, never have I been as proud to be part of hospitality as I have during COVID. I saw how the industry pivoted their businesses to make it work in such extreme circumstances so yet the fun element is is really important to me and it, in fact it's one of the things that I say like I recently talked to all of our staff it's like 700 nearly 750 staff and I stood up and said you know what what is it about Nightcap what what is it that makes us different and you know often I get asked like that by city investors and it'd be so easy to give the textbook answer well it's our return on investment model it's the way that we choose our property it's the business model etc cetera, etc cetera. the replicability block but it's actually not all of those things it's the people and we're really a recruitment business that's what we do we recruit really great people and what sets us apart is the fact that the people that we've recruited within Nightcap we don't always get it right, obviously, but for the for the most part are exceptional at the things that they are are good at. But we don't take ourselves too seriously. We have fun doing it. It's a good journey. We enjoy. We can laugh. We're not saving people's lives in, you know, in surgery. You know, we, we have fun doing it. And it's extremely important to me that that culture, as we get bigger... And it's harder to do as you get bigger, much harder, is retained. You've got to be the best of the best. So there's no room for mediocrity at all, not interested, whether that's in a bar or in an individual's performance. Mediocrity cannot exist. Be the best of the best, but have fun doing it. 
So you're right, the fun element is very, very, it's certainly very important to me. And I think that that really filters down throughout all of the businesses, actually, more and more. I do actually feel like the hospitality industry has had this moment to shine. I think the general public, I mean, I don't know what the right phrase is, they just took for granted the pub down the street. They just took for granted the restaurants. And then all of it was taken away from them. And suddenly people were going... I just want to go for a drink somewhere. I just want to get a cocktail. And then, you know, these things became really important to people, didn't they? Do you know what? That's, I, that's just made all the hairs on my arms. You're so right. That, that is exactly... Uh, I mean, you just articulated it so much better than I did. You're absolutely right. It was, it was a moment where we were more than a pint and a bag of crisps. We became a really important part of people's lives and as i said earlier i i really do believe that we positively as an industry impacted people's mental health a lot during covid i think we provided a safe haven for a bit of normality at a time when nothing was normal and nightcap is doing well it just recently got 10 million pounds from hsbc that's not bad is it sarah what are you gonna do no it's great that is actually i'm really pleased about that because it also you know it obviously again positively impacts the roi model but it's also um allows us to expand and take advantage really if you want to use the word take advantage always sounds so mercenary when you say take advantage but take advantage of the property market you know there are still great deals out there we are you know signing long-term leases on terms that I've never seen before never seen we've just I think we've just recently paid our first premium and we've signed how many sites you know since we since we started and we're you know we've got a lot in the pipeline and when I look at some of the sites that we have taken they're phenomenal we never would have been able to get hands on these years ago because it just wouldn't have worked you would have had to pay 750 grand premium and now we're paying nothing for that same site that really really makes a difference to your return on capital invested and then of course when you look at including the debt and we're very very grateful for hsbc's support i mean we actually had a bit of a a bit of a beauty parade so that was nice to see that you know well capitalized well-run businesses are you know, the money's there, the support is there. The finance team and, and our, our CFO had done all of the, you know, started the, shortlisted the beauty parade and done the shortlist and done the, um, a lot of the upfront negotiations. So I was like, we've got to go out with these people just to make sure that they, they get it. They understand the dream. What if we wanted to do another acquisition, for example? Would, be, would they be there to support that? Or is this just debt for capex you know so we did the uh the cocktail test so we all went out for a drink with them we're like can we work with these people do they can they have a laugh like us um and yeah they were great they passed the cocktail test yeah and you 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 have the people you work with whether it's your staff or the people on your board or your partners you're working with it is very important that you get on with them isn't it it can't just be about the access to the money because you you're looking for long-term ventures with a lot of these people oh god i mean completely i mean back to that like i don't have a career path i have a life path i mean i've just do have no interest whatsoever of working with people that one i don't like two are, you know, just don't get it. They're not on the same journey as us. No sense of humour. I have no interest. And don't we don't need to. There are enough great people out there for us to be able to work with great people. How much of your philosophy now and the way that you work now has that come from? You've talked about not having a career journey, but a kind of life journey from, from those very early beginnings of Sarah Willingham back then when you were doing the, the newspaper round for your local news agent, how much of, of, of what you originally started with remains with you today? There's, there's a couple of things. That's a good question, actually. Nobody's ever asked me that. Um, so I think there's a couple of things. You know, you take the girl out of Stoke, but you can never take Stoke out of the girl. And I still have my mum sat on my shoulder telling me to look after the pennies and the pounds and look after themselves. So I'm very detailed in the numbers. I think that will always be my way. I started off in hospitality after my paper round, always had a pound in my pocket, always grafted, always had a little job. 
um, but started in hospitality when I was 13 and never really left it. I've always had some kind of job, whether that's waiting on behind the bar, making the coffee, whatever it might have been. Um, Actually, earlier on this year at Nightcap, with one of the businesses, I just, I couldn't get my head around the numbers. And in the end, I rolled my sleeves up and got in. And I think once an operator, always an operator. So because that's the route I've come into hospitality was, you know, waiting tables, writing rotors. I understand the different aspects of of hospitality from the absolute grassroots. Um, It's definitely my default setting as much as I love all of the corporate financing and the structuring I love the sort of big picture structuring side of it you know hence an IPO and it's much my husband's much better at it than I am actually he's fantastic Michael who's a co-founder but we both have a really strong understanding of that but really when it comes to it I can get very very detailed and I think that's the that's from those early days you know, of of really working grassroots in hospitality. I don't think that ever leaves you at all. Um, And I think also my experiences over the years when I've been part of a group structure. So when I had the Bombay Bicycle Club and I, I bought the Bombay Bicycle Club and being financed from a similar group structure to Nightcap, uh, whilst I was sat on the board of uh, the Clapham House group, I, to begin with, was the MD of one of the subsidiaries. So I've also set up another group structure called NutriHealth with Michael. But again, so having done both sides of it, we definitely sat down with Nightcap and went, right, if we had our time again with those other businesses, what would we have done differently? Let's do it right this time. Let's learn from those experiences. So there's no doubt that there's learning in terms of we've seen it work from both sides uh, and go, right, how do we set it up to to keep as much culture as we possibly can, but also to make sure that the MDs are the most empowered that they can be to run their businesses and that we don't mess about with the individual cultures within within the businesses that we bought. It's really, really important. I would say all of those things have come with me into Nightcap. And I think they won't go. They're things you hold on to. You know, you can't fight nature, right? So it's so natural now because it's part of, of, of history. It's almost like you, know, you slice me down the middle and operator hospitality. So um, that's not going to go anywhere. That was Sarah Willingham from Nightcap. For more interviews, news and analysis, pick up the Evening Standard newspaper or head to standard.co.uk forward slash business. How to be a CEO is back on Monday morning. Start your week with us. I'll see you then. 